Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله لا إله إلا الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهدي ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله العظيم من شرور أنفسنا من سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله أدى الأمانة وبلغ الرسالة ونصح للأمة وكشف الغمة وتركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيغ عنها إلا هالك فعليه أفضل الصلاة وتم التسليم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصل بالحق وتواصل بالصبر أمين رب العالمين وأوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله وقد أمرنا بالحق وقال تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ثم أما بعد we begin by praising Allah, by bearing witness that none has the right to be worshipped or unconditionally obeyed except for one God. And that Muhammad وسلم, is his final messenger. We ask Allah to send his peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers, upon the family and companions of our messenger وسلم, and to join us with him and his family and his companions in Jannat al-Firdaus, in the highest level of paradise. Allahumma ameen. Dear brothers and sisters, when we look at the when we look at the accomplishments of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we look at what makes him a successful individual across all different spheres, not just the sphere of prophethood, but as Michael Hart said, the only man who was both supremely successful on the religious and secular level in a way that is admirable even to his foes. When you look at the Prophet ﷺ and what he was able to do with the people that were around him, 
you find that there is this tendency to underestimate his influence on his companions in their daily lives and to just focus on the glorious moments, the glorious episodes from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. What I mean by that is that each and every single companion that came to the Messenger ﷺ came in very raw form. Some with very backwards cultural practices. Some with a harshness that had been conditioned in them for decades that culminated sometimes in even the killing of their own children. Some that had lived lives of immorality that would be unmatched today. He had people in front of him that came from all sorts of background and he was dealing with an entire community of raw converts that had to be taught not just theology all over again, but that had to restructure and reshape their lives in accordance with this new divine revelation. And the fact that, that out of this generation, it didn't take another generation to perfect the message of the Prophet ﷺ, but that this became such a pristine generation that contained the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, and the likes of Fatima and Khadija and Aisha and Umm Salama, and the likes of Umm Sulaim and the likes of Abdullah ibn Umar, the fact that he was able to take this generation and to mold them in this way that they not only learned the religion but internalized it in a way that beautified their character and made them spiritually and institutionally mature enough to be able to pass it on to their children and to another generation and to establish a continuity of the message of the Prophet ﷺ is one of the greatest testaments to the ability of our Messenger ﷺ to mentor and to teach and to see people in their raw form and not discount them due to their obvious manifestations of jahili of ignorance. But instead the potential that he saw in the people that were being brought to him to be great human beings, great Muslims, great leaders, great believers, great community members, great husbands, great wives, great fathers, great mothers, great sons, great daughters. He saw it in them وسلم, when they came. And yes, some people came to him more refined, like Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Bakr was already on Islam before Islam. He already had it, right? He understood growing up that worshipping idols was not logical to him. He understood already that there must be only one God. He understood that drinking alcohol was not good for him. This is all before Islam. He accompanied the Prophet ﷺ. He had a very similar character to the Messenger ﷺ. So he was already refined. But the Prophet ﷺ was able to fit and accommodate in the same masjid a person as refined as Abu Bakr and a man that walks into the masjid and does not understand that it's probably not a good idea for me to start urinating in the corner of a house of worship. And he was able to treat that man with mercy and to accommodate in the same community Abu Bakr and that man. He was able to accommodate people from all different social classes, from all different backgrounds and refine them. And that is not just a skill that was given to our Prophet it was a skill given to all the Prophets and Messengers. When Allah speaks to us about Jesus, peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salam and his disciples, when he stands up, and he says to the Hawariyun, he says to the disciples, Man Ansari ilallah, who will be my helpers? Who will be my helpers in the cause of God? Qal al nahnu Ansarullah. The disciples stand and they say, We are the helpers of God. Amanna billah. We believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Washhad bi anna muslimun. And bear witness that we are amongst those that have submitted ourselves alongside you. We are amongst the Muslims. Isa alayhi salam was able to impart his tarbiyah his own spirituality, his own divine uh, refinement on this group of young people that were with him to the point that they immediately rose to the occasion when he asked them, who will be my helpers besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who will help me in the cause of Allah? So the ability to impart it is quite phenomenal. And it's something that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and something that he blessed few people with in history.
You know, last, uh, last week I was at the Islamic school fundraiser for my, for my kids. And I was asked to speak for 10 minutes. And I asked the audience, I said, if you could give me the top five accomplishments of Umar al-Farooq, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, the second Khalifa of Islam. Tell me what his accomplishments are. Tell me his top five. One person raised their hand and said, well, Jerusalem. Obviously, bringing Palestine into his fold and doing it in a way that was beautiful. Without bloodshed, in a way that he ensured the protection of the communities that were already there with a smooth transition. Some mentioned his precedence in justice. Some mentioned that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, his epic battles against the Persians. Right? But these are the things that typically, some mentioned the year of the famine, the year Am al Ramada, when Umar radiallahu anhu took the ummah out of its most difficult time. And I said, no one here mentioned Abdullah bin Umar as one of the accomplishments of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The fact that from Umar radiallahu anhu, he was able to produce a son that was exactly like him that loved the sunnah as much as him, that walked and talked and had the same sense of justice and moral courage as him, to the point that when he passes away, the people come to Umar and say, look, can you make your son the Khalifa? We'll accept him. Because Abdullah ibn Umar would be a continuation of your legacy, of your greatness, because he represents what you represent. He instilled in him those same values. He rubbed off on him to that extent that he looked just like his father, acted just like him, and upheld the same values and love that his father upheld. Who asks for monarchy, to tra or, or who asks for hereditary rule in history? No one does that. But they saw the blessings of his son. And look what ends up happening. From his, great, from his grandson, you have Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah ta'ala, who continues the same legacy of Umar. You have his daughter, Hafsa who has the same love for the Qur'an that he has. And it's in her house that the Qur'an was collected. That's legacy as well. The ability of Umar radiallahu anhu to impart that same love for the Qur'an and the sunnah into his children. It's legacy of the Prophet ﷺ when Aisha mentions his daughter because it starts at home. And she says about Fatima radiallahu anha, I have never seen anyone who looks, walks, talks, acts, or resembles the Prophet ﷺ in character like his daughter Fatima radiallahu anha. Fatima was a copy of the Prophet ﷺ. The ability to impart that is powerful. It's profound. And it has to start with your example being profound enough to be duplicated. That other people would want to be like you, starting with your own children and your own small space. That takes a methodology in seeing the goodness in the raw person in front of you, in that canvas in front of you, and helping them find their identity and grow into their best self. Starting with your own family and your own social circle. It starts there. That is of the greatest accomplishments of the Prophet ﷺ. And where does that come from? The fact that he looked at you ﷺ and he saw your qualities, he did not see your flaws. He saw your qualities, he did not see your flaws. A person who is ugly on the inside will only see ugliness in everything around them. Everything around them is flawed, deeply flawed. You look at this person and all you see is the ugliness and your su'a dhan, your evil assumption of them is because you've seen your own experience in evilness. And you assume that anyone that displays the, the, the characteristics that you display when you engage in evilness is as evil as you if not more evil. That's where su'a dhan comes from. Always seeing that in people. Always seeing that in everything around you. Because that's who you are on the inside too. So you see it in others. Our Messenger وسلم, teaches us the opposite of that. That if you have someone in front of you that has 25% good, 75% evil, build that 25%. Don't say to them, your 25% is suffocated by the 75. We see that in many different instances with him. Abdullah bin Umar, who we just mentioned, who said that the Prophet وسلم, every day after prayer, he would sit and he would say, who has a good dream to share with us? Who, who saw something in their uh, dreams last night that they could share with us. 
So Abdullah bin Umar, in his eagerness to engage with the Prophet Sallallahu he said, I wanted to see a dream so bad, just so I could say it the next day. So I can engage with the Prophet ﷺ. So he makes dua to see a dream at night. And what dream does he see? He sees a dream of the angels taking him to hellfire. And just as they're about to take him to the hellfire, finally, they say to him that this is not your place. And he says that I saw hellfire, I saw the people in it, I saw its, grievous, I saw its grievousness, I've seen... The, the, the horror of hellfire in that dream. And they said, this is not your place. And then they took him and he was taken to paradise. But it's not a good dream because Abdullah bin Umar saw hellfire. So suddenly he's frightened by that dream. And he's too embarrassed to tell the Prophet ﷺ about what he saw. So he asked Hafsa, his sister, to talk to the Prophet ﷺ. When Hafsa tells the Prophet ﷺ what Abdullah saw, the Messenger ﷺ responds, and he knows that his response will go back to Abdullah with its, with its words and with its tone. And so he says, Ni'ma rajulu Abdullah. What a blessed young man Abdullah is. What a beautiful young man he is. Ni'ma rajul. Such a great young man. If only he'd pray a little bit at night. He's such an amazing young man. But if only he would add to his amazingness, <laughs> to his goodness, to his spectacular character, exemplary, you know, young role model for the rest of the youth of the Prophet around the Prophet and in fact, even the elders. If only he would add to that some qiyam. He didn't say, Bi'sa rajul Abdullah. What a bad young man Abdullah is. He doesn't pray at night. Ma yaqoom al layl. He said, what a good, blessed young man this is. But if only he'd add to that goodness a little bit of qiyam. So when it gets to Abdullah, it gets to him with hope. It doesn't get to him in a way that would demotivate him and tell him that the reason why you saw this is because you're not praying at night. It gets to him in a way that allows him to strive to be his better self. That's the impact the Messenger وسلم, has on the people around him. He had this ability والسلام, that when you came in his presence, you left a better person. You left a better Muslim, you left a better father, a better husband, a better wife. You left a better person. You were inspired to be better by being in his presence because he never beat you down to your lower self. Instead, he built you up to your higher self. He saw the goodness in you and then built on that with his own children with his own family, with his closest companions. In his admonishing them, he would always qualify his admonishing them by saying something good about them first. So that they understand this is not throwing you out altogether. You think about the way we deal with each other in our community. Someone exhibits a negative quality. And we're willing to throw out everything and focus on that negative quality. And the only thing that does is it robs the Muslim community of a potentially great activist or a potentially great student or a potentially great community leader. Because we honed in on something negative about that person, we threw out everything else and we amplified the negative. We amplified the ugliness in our own ugliness. As opposed to amplifying the beauty in the people around us through our own beauty, seeing people through that lens as opposed through the lens of beating them down. And that's our fault sometimes. When Mu'adh radiallahu anhu would lead the companions in prayer, in a masjid, the Bedouin uh, tribe in prayer, he would lead his people in prayer, pray Aisha with the Prophet and then go lead them. And someone complained that the Prophet, he complained to the Prophet that he took too long in his salah, that he prayed for too long, Mu'ad's you know, gut reaction was, what a hypocrite. You don't like long salahs? You don't like listening to the Qur'an? What a hypocrite. The Prophet ﷺ did not tell this man, you know, look, the Qur'an was revealed to me, it is beautiful, it is profound, you should enjoy reading it. And the Messenger ﷺ is the same one that would stand up at night reading the Qur'an until his feet would swell. He never got sick of the Qur'an. 
So you talk about just from an experiential perspective, it's hard for the Prophet ﷺ to relate to a man saying that that's too much Qur'an for me. It, if there's a disconnect there. But the Messenger ﷺ understands, I'm not going to take this man to task for that. Instead he calls Mu'adh and he says, Afatanun anta ya Mu'adh? Are you running people away from God? Inna minkum munafireen. Some of you run people away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not his fault, it's your fault for not understanding where he was at and bringing him to his better self, to where he would want to recite the Qur'an the way that you recite the Qur'an, and where he would find enjoyment the way that you find enjoyment. Afatanun ant. Are you running people away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah warns us of this in the Qur'an. رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Oh Allah, don't make us a trial for those who disbelieve. That they would either see us, and one of the manifestations of that, the, the primary is that they would be given victory over the believers and think then that the cause that they fight under is a justified and a moral cause. And there's a sign that the divine power is with them as they persecute believers. That's one. The second one though, the second manifestation of that ayah, is that people see you as a representation of your faith. They see you as a representation of Islam. Whether you like it or not, you are a representative of Islam, especially in this intensified climate of Islamophobia. People are looking for an excuse to hate you. <laughs> you don't need to give them much. You represent your faith. They see you acting in a certain way, they will see the entire faith that way. On the other hand, even within the community itself, we can become a fitna for those who believe. You know, subhanAllah, uh, if, you, if you look at some of the psychological studies of how people perceive God and how they are able to come to the knowledge of God and spiritually enjoy a relationship with God, people view God naturally by instinct the same way that they view those that are most beloved to them and close to them. Meaning if those that are most beloved to them and close to them, especially in a place of authority, are abusive, they will perceive God in an abusive fashion. So we could be munafireen, running people away, even our children sometimes, because of the harshness. لو كنت فضلاً غليظ القلب لن فضل من حولك. The Prophet ﷺ was even told that if you're harsh-hearted and rough, people will disperse from around you. Instead, take them in. Grow them, see the goodness in them, and make them better than what they presently are. Don't beat people down. Not in our own community and not outside of our community. See the good and extract it and amplify it as opposed to the opposite. One of the things that Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala mentions in this regard, which is very profound, is that the Prophet sallallahu did not see even his enemies in the same light. He even could see potential in his enemies, those that were persecuting him, actively persecuting him. We have a tendency as Muslims even, especially in our own Islam, our 21st century Islamophobia, there was Islamophobia in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu to put everyone who is in opposition to us in one bucket and to define them by the worst of them and to say they all hate us because of this and everyone falls into that bucket. The Prophet ﷺ was able to see amongst those that were actively persecuting him that they were not all the same. And he made dua for some specific ones. Allahumma izz al-Islam bi habul umraini ilayk. Oh Allah, give, give victory to the religion through the, the, the more beloved of the two Umars to you, Umar ibn al-Khattab and Amr ibn Hisham, Abu Jahl. If you lived in that time and you saw Abu Jahl and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, you would think they were exactly the same. You wouldn't see that Umar is different from Abu Jahl, but the Prophet ﷺ saw some qualities in Umar that made him different. And he was right. He grew those qualities. Islam didn't change those qualities. Islam bettered them and beautified them in a way that they would be productive. But the Messenger ﷺ saw that. In the Battle of Badr, as the Prophet ﷺ sees the army coming towards them, these are people that want to massacre them. He looks at them and he says, In yakun fil qawmi khair fa fi sahib al-ibl al-ahmar. He says, if there is any good in these people, I can see it in the one who's riding the red horse. And he meant Ubay ibn Khalaf. He said, he's not Abu Jahl. He's not Abu Lahab. There's something different about him right now. 
He looks different. Not Umayyah ibn Khalaf, sorry, Umayyah. He saw Umayyah ibn Khalaf and he said that he looks different. If there is some khayr in these people that would stop them and restrain them, it would be him. He saw it in his eyes. Everyone else is sitting there looking. Well, they all look like enemies to us. They're all riding horses and carrying swords. I can't see any difference between them. I don't see any good in any of them. They all look evil. The Prophet ﷺ saw something different. And he wanted to extract that. He says that amongst these people, there are some people, أُخْرِجُوا karha. Some of these people came out in the Battle of Badr to fight us and they were forced out. They, didn't, they, have, they don't have any interest in killing us or fighting us. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned some names including Al-Abbas He said when you find them, be gentle with them. They're not out there to kill you. They were moved by the current. But they don't hate you. They're not out there to kill you. He's telling them to even distinguish amongst their enemies. So what then about your brothers and sisters? In our generalizations and putting people in buckets, bucket after bucket after bucket, so that we stop seeing people as people, and we see them as groups. Isn't that what we complain about all the time? We do it to ourselves, and we do it to our enemies, and we do it to people that we perceive to be our enemies. But Allah says, لَيْسُوا سَوَىٰ They're not all the same. No two people are the same. Each and every single person has a unique experience. And if they are living their lives in a way that's distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you have to try to diagnose what, what that experience was that made that life more convenient for them and help them see themselves out of it. Each activist has an experience. And if they are passionate about something and they're misguided in their passion, maybe, or you deem that to be a misguidance in their passion, then you have to validate the experience that made them passionate about that cause and redirect it in a way that's, uh, that, that is Islamically beloved. Not throw them off and write them off and put them all in one bucket. When you see people in front of you, make them better, don't make them worse. Because that's what we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see in us. We want Allah to see in us the good and we want to say, to, we, we believe when we stand in prayer, and when we do what we're supposed to be doing, or we think we're doing what we're supposed to be, we believe that we're still essentially good people despite our flaws. We still believe that. We believe we should be given a chance by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by the people around us because we only see the best of ourselves, but we only see the worst of others. Everyone else is defined by their flaws. We're defined despite our flaws in our own eyes. That's a problem. And our Messenger وسلم, taught us something different. In conclusion, to make this practical as much as I can, and I apologize if it's not, and if it just seems like you know, a read of the Prophet وسلم, I want you to think about the people around you that are experiencing Islam through you. That are experiencing your faith through you in some capacity. Are you making them better people or are you making them worse? Are you making them love Allah more or are you making them more distant from God? I want you to think about the people in your community that do work. Do you see the good in what they do and try to help them through some of the blind spots and the mistakes or do you only see the mistakes in a way that you negate all of their good? It goes back to your own perspective of people. And then if the answer to these questions is that you are amongst those that are distancing people from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's important for you to reconsider your own connection with Allah and what you want from Allah and how you then project that on the other servants of Allah that are around you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to build the people around us and to build ourselves. May Allah guide us and guide through us. May Allah rectify our hearts and rectify through us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify us as individuals and allow us to be amongst those that rectify entire communities and societies. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to see the beauty in others and to only have our beauty seen on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our shortcomings and make us a people who are forgiving of other people's shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardon in us and forgive us and show mercy to us and allow us to have the capacity in this world to pardon and show mercy and forgive others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring about change in a positive way through us. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be agents for all that is good. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa lisa'al al-muslimin fa astaghfiru innahu wa al-ghafur rahim. If everyone could move forward inshallah. If everyone can move forward, inshaAllah. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Rabbil Alameen, Wala Udwan Ila Ala Zalameen, Wala Aqiba Tul Mutakin, Allah Musali was Salam Barak Al Abdika Rasulika Muhammadin Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wala Anihi Wasahbi Wasallam Tasim and Kathira, Allah Mufril the Mu'minina Wal Mu'minat, Wal Muslimina Wal Muslimat, Al Ahya Imin Homal Amwat, Inna Kasamir and Karib and Mujibu Dawat, Allah Mufrilana or Hamna, Wafu Anna, Wala to Adzibna, Robbena Zalamna and Fusana, and Lam Tafrilana, what are Hamna, Lanaku and Anna Minal Hasirin, Allah Ma Inna Kafu and Karim and Tuhibul Afu Fafu. اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاعف عنا لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إنا كنا من الظالمين اللهم اغفر لوالدينا رب ارحمهما كما ربونا صغارا ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم انصر المستضعفين في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها اللهم انصر المستضعفين في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها اللهم أهلك الظالمين بالظالمين وأخرجنا وإخواننا من بينهم سالمين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء القرب وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم واشكروه على نعماء يزد لكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقيم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله Please make sure your lines are straight and there are no gaps between you. Allah <coughs> Akbar. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem Sirat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim Ghayri Al-Maghdubi Alayhim يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن جاءكم فاسق بنبأ فتبينوا فتبينوا أن تصيبوا قوما بجهالة فتصبحوا على ما فعلتم نادمين واعلموا أن فيكم رسول الله لو يطيعكم في كثير من الأمر لعنتم ولكن الله حبب إليكم الإيمان وزينه في قلوبكم 
وكره إليكم الكفر والفسوق والعصيان أولئك هم الراشدون فضلا من الله ونعمه فضلا من الله ونعمه والله عزيز حكيم الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين وإن طائفتان من المؤمنين اقتتلوا فأصلحوا بين أخويكم وإن بغت إحداهما على الأخرى فقاتلوا التي تبغي حتى تفيء إلى أمر الله فإن فاءت فأصلحوا بينهما بالعدل وأقسطوا إن الله يحب المقسطين إنما المؤمنون إخوة إنما المؤمنون إخوة فأصلحوا بين أخويكم واتقوا الله لعلكم ترحمون الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله اكبر الله اكبر الله اكبر الله اكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله